And, and that's actually a very general problem that comes up, of course, in many different contexts in thinking about biological systems, but also more generally. And that is that there are many problems in which we have many variables. Um, let me just... Um, I have many variables, and in contrast to uh, the sort of immediate thing that you were just hearing about, instead of trying to write down the dynamics for the individual variables, what I'd like to do is to um, take a probabilistic description. I imagine that for a variety of reasons there's um, some randomness in the system, and so it's natural to ask what is the joint distribution of all of these variables. And it might be, and I'm actually not going to talk, so there's, in the simplest view, this would be that you take a snapshot of the system at some moment in time, and you ask, what is the joint distribution out of which all the variables are drawn? You could take a view which is both probabilistic and dynamical, and you can do that in two ways. So you might want to add dynamics. And one way to do it would be to say that this probability distribution itself depends on time. But a, a different way of doing this would be to say, what if I tried to write the probability distribution for the trajectories of the individual variables, which is, of course, much harder. Right? This is a distribution over n variables at each moment in time. But this is actually a distribution over functions. Right? And in fact, this problem is non-trivial. Even if you only have one variable, right? describing the, the way in which the, 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 the distribution of trajectories is obviously a much more complicated problem than just describing the distribution of the variable. And in some sense, this problem, if you think about dividing time up into many slices, uh, and let's say there are capital N slices, then this problem goes back to being a problem rather like this. So your many variables are now the same variable at different moments in time. Okay? So the point is that the variables they could be many things. They could be the abundances of species, which is directly connected to what you've been hearing about, or maybe genotypes, if you're doing population genetics. But they could be other things. Um, they could be. Uh, the behavioral states of organisms. So for example, I might think about the behaviors that an individual organism does across time. So I'd be interested in the distribution of behavioral trajectories. Of course, the most uh, glorious example of this would be the distribution of things that I'm about to say. Right? Not, so not, not glorious because I'm about to say it, things that humans say. Right? So uh, if you think about the sequence of, uh, of words in a text, right, this is an example of this. And, and of course, this is an example that's interesting both conceptually because it's about human language, but it's also interesting practically because you interact, you may not realize this, but you interact with these probabilistic models all the time. So uh, I don't know how many of you have something on your, uh, on your cell phone that suggests the next word in the sentence that you're trying to write, or finishes the spelling of a word that you've begun. So that actually all happens because underneath it, there's some probabilistic model for the sequence of letters or words. Okay. But you could be interested not only in the, in the trajectories of behavioral states of individual organisms, you could also be interested in the 
states taken on at one moment in time by many organisms in a group. So if you think about a flock of birds, a school of fish, a swarm of insects, the fact that they're all moving in the same direction is a statement, of course not exactly the same, so the, state, the fact that they're all moving in the same direction is an approximate statement. The statement that you might want to make more precise is what is actually the distribution of those directions across the entire flock or swarm. Okay. If you want to dig inside, you might think about the states of neurons in a network. Um, and uh, although I'm not going to talk about it here, you might also think about um, the levels of gene expression of the very large number of genes that go into determining um, the state of a cell. Okay, so again, if I look across a large population of cells, I will find that different genes are expressed at different levels. Obviously, they regulate each other. Um, also, you need certain combinations of them to work together, so the joint distribution over these many gene expression levels will be non-trivial. Now, the idea of building probabilistic models of this sort has become a big industry, in part because of practical things like the example I was giving you with your phone. Um, and it's become a topic in applied mathematics, computer science. There are different families of models um, that uh, have the feature that you can learn the parameters of those models by some very efficient algorithm, uh, and so on. But the primordial example of probabilistic <laughs> models in the natural sciences is actually statistical mechanics. So as, uh, actually, this is perhaps a good time to ask. Um, how many physicists in the room? Hmm. Right, so if you were very dilute, then, then it would be easy. And if you were an overwhelming majority, then I could just apologize to everybody else. But you're this sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> yes. Hopefully not the valley of death, but uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so as many of you know very well, and as I hope the rest of you know vaguely, perhaps from a physical chemistry course or something like this, um, somewhere in the 1800s, uh, the physics community turned from the kind of clockwork Newtonian view of the universe to saying, well, if I want to describe a world which is built out of atoms and molecules, at a time when there was no direct evidence for the existence of atoms and molecules, I will remind you. It wasn't a new idea, of course, it goes back thousands of years, but there was no direct evidence and it was not widely believed. Um, if I think that the world is built out of atoms and molecules, then although I might take the Newtonian point of view that says that, well, I should write, equa I should write differential equations that describe the motions of all these individual molecules, there are so many of them that this becomes kind of hopeless. And so instead, the idea was maybe I can, just, I can imagine taking a snapshot of the states of all of these molecules, their positions, their velocities, and so on, and I can describe the probability distribution out of which they're being drawn. And there's a subtlety here about where, why is it probabilistic. One, view, one simple view for the sake of this discussion is, well, it's because the moment at which you decided to look was a random moment relative to the underlying dynamics. So if you picked another moment, you would see something else. Of course, it's complicated, right, because you think that the evolution from one moment to the next is deterministic. So why things should look random, that's a subtle problem. But nonetheless, this proved to be extraordinarily powerful. And it's a subject whose evolution continues to this day. And in, um, in statistical mechanics, the microscopic variables are the states 
of atoms and molecules. And the subject of statistical mechanics is how one goes from an understanding of what the atoms and molecules are doing up to a description of the macroscopic collective behavior of a very large number of these. So this should remind you of the problem of asking about, if I know the rules, let's say, for how uh, birds in a flock interact with their neighbors to decide which direction to fly in, can I predict the, what the whole flock looks like? Right? So you want to go from a kind of microscopic description to a macroscopic description. And um, so using this probability, this joint probability distribution of all the microscopic variables, you can go from a micro description to a macro description. Now, in this process, this can happen. So I invite you to think about how this might work in your favorite biological example. And obviously, over the course of these lectures, I'm going to give you several examples. But you should realize, before you start, you kind of know several, there's a few different things that might happen. And you should kind of be on the lookout for them. So the, the least interesting is that what you see macroscopically is just the sum of all the microscopic things. And for those of you who are not physicists, you've been exposed almost certainly to one example of this, and this is the ideal gas law. So if I think about molecules in this room moving at random, and there's some probability distribution for all of their velocities and their positions, then there's some probability per unit time that they're going to run into the wall. And every time they run into the wall, they bounce off and they transfer momentum. And if you keep transferring momentum, that's equivalent to applying a force. But every molecule is doing it more or less independently of every other molecule. So the force on the walls, and on us, by the way, is the sum over all these independent molecular collisions. And if you work it out, you recover the ideal gas law. Okay, right? The force divided by an area is the pressure. And the typical velocities are related to the temperature. And then you need to know how many molecules there are and in how big a box you're in, and out comes the ideal gas law. Okay? And this is a case in which the effects are just additive. Ideal means that the molecules aren't interacting with each other. So nothing interesting, in a way, nothing interesting happens. Except there is one interesting thing that happens, which is that your view is that each molecule is doing things at random. And yet, you say there is a pressure on the walls, which is a, determin a relatively deterministic thing. So something emerges, which is a deterministic law from things which are microscopically probabilistic. And so the interesting thing that happens here is that n goes to infinity. You get something deterministic. Strictly speaking, you get something that's true with probability one, okay, if you really want to be formal about it. And if you've never taken a system, so let's, how do I do this experiment? If you're not a physicist, raise your hand. If you, let's see, which way do I want to do this? If you, if you know this, so keep your hands up. Let's like, see this correct? Now, if you know what the central limit theorem is, put your hands down. OK, pretty close. Good. So the central limit theorem right, is the statement that if I take a bunch of random variables, which are reasonably well behaved, and for those of you who don't know what it is, trying to say reasonably well behaved more carefully isn't going to help. So let me say reasonably well behaved. <laughs> right? I mean, that's where all the, that's where all the work is, right? Um, if you take a bunch of individual random variables that are reasonably well behaved and you average them together, then if you average more and more of them together, 
the thing that you're looking at, the variable which you get, will appear to come out of a Gaussian distribution. And it will get closer and closer to being a Gaussian distribution the more and more things you average together. Furthermore, if you average them rather than adding them, the variance will actually shrink. And in the case, in simple cases like this, that is the origin That is the origin of the emergence of determinism. It's nothing more complicated than the central limit theorem. Okay? And indeed, there's a certain part of statistical mechanics, the general problem of deriving macroscopic behaviors from microscopic behaviors, which is recognizing where the central limit theorem is doing its job for you inside the calculation and pulling that out. And so in that sense, if you know something about that part of mathematics, then Although the language of statistical mechanics might be unfamiliar, there isn't anything going on that you don't really know about. But of course, this is not the most interesting case. So, well, let me say not equal to the microscopic variables. So, the interesting cases are when the variables which emerge at the micro macroscopic scale are not just the sum of the individual variables. Okay. So, Um, or more, uh, the more complicated way, so, so one thing that can happen is you get um, things which are the sum, of, well, okay. They're either not the sum of the microscopic variables or they obey surprising equations. Let me be very vague about this. They obey surprising equations. So for example, in a fluid, if you want to ask how fast is this chunk of fluid moving, the answer is just add up the velocities of all the molecules inside. And so in that sense, the thing you call the fluid velocity is the sum, or the average, depending on how you think about it, of the velocities of all the molecules. But what's surprising is that that fluid velocity obey, and the density of the fluid is basically the number of molecules that you find in a given volume, right? So you can think of making lots of little volumes and you count, is there a molecule there or not? You sum up all those variables, right? And you get the fluid density and the fluid velocity. What's totally not obvious is that the fluid density and fluid velocity obey a set of equations and they're the same equations for an enormous variety of fluids. So somewhere in the process of going from the microscopic description to the macroscopic description, in the microscopic description you had molecules and they're bumping into each other and there's some force law for how they push on each other. In the macroscopic description, there's a fluid velocity, and that force law, by the way, is different for every kind of molecule. It's, right? So for example, um, think about water and alcohol. You remember your chemistry course, you can picture what these molecules look like. They interact with each other in very different ways. In particular, alcohols can be long, right? Whereas water is just three atoms. There's all that hydrogen bonding that happens with the, with the water, which is all very beautiful and produces these complicated cage-like structures and everything that doesn't happen with alcohol. But you know, if you pour alcohol and you pour water, it looks the same. And in fact, it obeys the same equations. There are two numbers that you need to know, the density and the, and the viscosity, and those numbers are a little bit different for water and alcohol. But remember that those numbers have units and nobody told you which system of units to choose. So you can choose units in which those things disappear. 
And now the equations that describe the flow of water and the flow of alcohol are exactly the same. Okay? And it's not just water and alcohol. You can do more dramatic examples. Furthermore, you can do, uh, you know, there's not much difference between fluids and gases for this purpose. <laughs> And so that means that the vortex that you see when you empty your drain in the bathtub, right, looks a lot like the, like, uh, the image of a tornado, right, or a, a storm that you see from a satellite, except that this is on the scale of centimeters and this is on the scale of uh, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers. Same equations. The reason they look the same is because they obey the same equations. Slight exaggeration, but not much. Okay? So, you can have the emergence of new variables, and you can have the emergence of new equations. And an important feature of this is that sometimes things become universal, so details get lost. So uh, this is the place to note, this is the physicist's dream for thinking about biology, is that all of those things they torment you with of microscopic details will somehow get lost, and I'll be able to write down something that is actually correct, but nonetheless ignores all of those details. So when people tell you, you know, your model is wrong because you're ignoring details, they should never fly in an airplane. <laughs> because you do not design an airplane by doing the molecular dynamics of air, right? You design it by solving the equations of fluid mechanics. So we all believe that it's okay sometimes to ignore details. What's astonishing in statistical mechanics is that we've sort of mastered the question how it, becomes, how it becomes legal, right? So it's not just that I can write down an approximate model. I can write down a model which I know will be correct in certain limiting cases. And in many cases, the limit that you need is that the scale on which you look is large compared to the atoms and molecules, which is to say almost everything that you see as a human is in the regime where this is okay. Yeah, it's an astonishing thing. So we have emergent variables, and if you want, this universality is a kind of emergent simplicity of our description. And let me emphasize that it's not simpler just because we've decided not to keep track of all the individual molecules. Right? Fluid mechanics is still pretty complicated. In fact, you know, the equations of fluid mechanics are correct down to a length scale. Well, let's, I mean, it's better than this, but let's, for the sake of discussion, let's think about microns. But you use them to describe the flow of air over an airplane wing, which again is tens of meters. So in the box that surrounds the airplane in which you're supposed to solve the equations of fluid mechanics, there's, let's see, micron to get to a meter, that's 10 to the sixth. To get to tens of meters, that's 10 to the seventh. If you make a box 10 to the seventh cube, that's 10 to the 21. If I made a slightly bigger airplane, I'd end up with, again, Avogadro's number of, box, of little, little boxes, right? The velocity and density are defined at Avogadro's number of places. Now, of course, if I kept track of what every single molecule was doing, I'd have vastly more. So it's true that I have fewer degrees of freedom than I started with, but I could still have lots. But the important point is that those degrees of freedom obey very simple equations, much simpler than what all the molecules are doing. OK. What took from the origins of statistical mechanics in the 1800s to let's say, the mid-1970s, was to understand how this is all possible. Okay. And that this notion of things becoming simpler as you go from microscopic to macroscopic is a systematic notion in which we can do real calculations. So that when we write down simple models of systems, it's not just wishful thinking. Okay? So, what I want to do is to tell you about several examples in which the ideas of statistical physics have been used to think about particular biological problems. 
And, um, well, the examples here are, unfortunately, I actually don't know how to do these examples. I've never worked on them. Um, there, there, is, there is a literature which is connected to something that I'm going to talk about, which I would love to understand, but I don't. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to give you examples um, from the states of organisms, the states of neural networks. I'll actually give you a more molecular example, um, in part because that's really the traditional unambiguous application of statistical mechanics, and also it's a problem that the biological community is very interested in at the moment. So it's a, a window into a different part of biology. And um, I think in all of the examples, uh, there's an interchange between um, theory and experiment, which is fairly detailed. And um, I think that's important because sometimes, right, if you're a physicist who grew up after all this thinking solidified, then your tendency is to say, well, I am now licensed to write down simplified models, and so you just proceed with doing this. And in fact, in your search for simplified models, you sometimes write down models whose relationship to the things that people can measure is a little unclear. So some of you may know the large literature on neural networks. If you go back to the origins of that literature, it's not obvious what the relationship is between the variables that people wrote down in the models and what you actually see when you stick an electrode in the brain. And so the field kind of, the relationship between uh, uh, the theory and observation was almost metaphorical, right? There's some, it's something like what's going on in the real system, but it's not clear how you would actually tie things together. Let me emphasize that in the core of statistical physics itself, these ideas about universality and the emergence of simple equations and everything, these are... These are all very quantitative ideas that connect in detail to experiments on real materials. Okay? It's not theory living up here and experiment living down here and they never quite meet, right? Or they meet only in some approximate way. Okay? So we would like to be able to make connections between theory. We'd like to make use of all of these ideas on the one hand, but we'd like to be able to do it in a way that allows us to make connections to detailed experiments on, bio, on real particular biological systems. Okay. And so that's the, that's the thing that will also be the theme going through all the lectures. And I should say that this is possible today, or has become possible in the last decade, because of an enormous advance in the quality of experiments. Okay. So if you think, uh, the first example I'm going to choose is actually um, the example of uh, flocking of birds. And if you go back 20 years, there was a very well-developed effort to build statistical mechanics models of flocking. And if you looked in the experimental or observational literature, there were qualitative observations on large groups of organisms, flocks, swarms, schools of fish. And then there were a few things where people said, ah, I have to find a way of doing a more controlled experiment. So let me take 12 fish and put them in a tank and watch them swim around. And in those days, you, you made a video and you tracked them by hand. And that's why you did 12, right? Because maybe you had the patience to track 12 things for 10 minutes or so and you kind of run out of steam after that. But remember that most of the interesting things that happen happen in the end goes to infinity limit. So Avogadro's number is infinity, as, or it might as well be. 12 is not infinity, right? <laughs> okay. So it's only when it becomes possible, for example, to track the positions and velocities of a thousand individual birds in a flock as it moves that you start to even have a hope of saying something that connects to these statistical mechanics ideas. Okay? So, um, I know that the structure is, we have a pause and there's more questions at the end. This has been very qualitative. But on the other hand, there are people in the room for whom these ideas are not familiar. So if there's a qualitative question at this point, that would be a good idea. 
because I'm going to shift gears and actually start thinking about flocks of birds. So there are people who say that uh, uh, this from micro to macro, that more is different. Yes. That you can't really do the mathematics and prove that you, something else has to be in. So, so there's two versions. So more is different um, refers to uh, um, a lecture that was given by Phil Anderson uh, actually in the 1960s and eventually was published as an article in Science in 1972, I believe. The lecture was in San Diego, actually. Um, and, um, yeah. But the more and deeper never said in the other physical direction. Right. So let me, let, me, let me unfold this. So at the time, um, part of the argument that Anderson was engaged in was between physicists who were interested in the emergence of interesting macroscopic behaviors, like superconductivity, magnetism, liquid crystals, actually, the fact that there are solids and liquids is a non-trivial example. Sorry, I have to do this one. Uh, just to be sure everybody understands what the problem is, right? Um, if this were liquid, well, first of all, I'd need a container, but never mind. If I had a drop of liquid that I could balance in my hand, if I push on it from one side, what happens is my finger goes through the liquid, right? On the other hand, because this is solid, if I push on one side, the other side moves. So now think about doing this with a block of ice. So to make it clear, right, I have a drop of water, a block of ice, same number of molecules. In absolute temperature, right, the difference is, only, the difference is a few percent. So I change a number by a few percent, I have a solid and a liquid. You say, okay, no big deal, I see this all the time. Well, actually, in some, I mean, in your freezer you see it. I live, I live in New York, we actually see it on the street sometimes, um, although less often than we used to, but never mind. Um, so what's the big deal? Well, the problem is, right, that molecules to first approximation only talk to their neighbors, right? They don't reach across a centimeter and, and interact with each other directly. When I push on a block of ice, right, I'm touching the molecules at the surface. But nonetheless, the molecule on the other side of the block moves. But it's several centimeters away. The distance between atoms is measured in angstroms. That's a factor of 100 million. So this is the equivalent of taking the population of the country and lining it up, right? And you tell somebody something at one end, and you expect that it somehow it makes it to the other end. So this is a game you might have played as a child, perhaps not, we refer to it as telephone. I don't know how it gets called in other places. Uh, and you know actually it doesn't work, right? If you tell somebody something at this end, if you make the chain long enough, then deterministically at the other end they don't know what you said. Um, correspondingly, there are no one-dimensional solids. The reason it works is because there are many paths through the three dimensions, and there are enough paths, right? The further away I go, the more paths I get, and that wins out, and that's enough to transmit the information that you're pushing from one end to the other. So this is completely surprising that this should actually work, and if you change the temperature by a few percent, it doesn't work. It becomes a liquid, and you push on one end, and the other end doesn't move. Yes? What do you mean by path? Ah, okay, so um, if you think that every molecule can only talk to its neighbors, then, if I'm, then one molecule, right, it has many neighbors, and so it has, let's say it has the neighbor that's immediately uh, in, the, in this direction, and then it has a neighbor here and a neighbor here. So I can think about walking, imagine the molecules are on a lattice, and I'm only allowed to walk step by step along the lattice. But if I go a long distance, there are many ways of going from one place to the other. There's the direct one, which is, which is the shortest, and you might think that would help, but it doesn't, because if it's long enough, the information will decay away anyway. The number of paths that... So in fact, you can think about the transition between different states of matter as being a competition between the loss of information along any single path and the, as you make the dis if you, in order for something to be ordered, like being a solid, then information has to propagate over very long distances. In, in this example, just the force, 
So you can think that there's a competition as the two points that I'm trying to connect get further and further away. On the one hand, along, the, along any single path, the information decays. On the other hand, the further I go, the more paths there are. And so there's a competition. If the decay is too fast, then it doesn't matter how many paths there are, and the information never gets to the other side, and the system is disordered. And if, the, if, if, the, if I tune things just right, they'll balance against each other, and that's where the phase transition occurs. And then I can go the other way, where if, if, the, if the decay along any single path, is still, it still decays, but decays slowly, then the system will be ordered. And you can call the paths in liquid because of the distance between molecules? So doing this for the liquid, for the, so doing this for the liquid solid transition is a little bit complicated. I might have gotten myself in trouble here. But the, Sorry. Um, but uh, yes, so you can think about the path. If you take a snapshot of the liquid, you can ask what, is, what are the paths along which the forces can actually be transmitted? So, for example, uh, yeah, so, it, so for instance, if you assume that the forces between molecules cut off at some distance, which is not exactly true, right, but it's close enough, then there's only a limited number of molecules that any one molecule can push on. Okay. And, and now, now, you have a disc, now you have discrete paths and everything. Good. Hmm. Okay, I escaped. Um, <laughs> without having to calculate anything else, okay, uh, which may not have helped. But okay, so um, good. Let's talk about flocks of birds. Okay? So the picture you should have in mind is I have a whole bunch of birds, and they're all generally going in the same direction. And each bird has the thing I called phi before, should now become the velocity with which, with which each bird is moving. And so if I want to understand what flocking means, I should describe the joint distribution of the velocities in the flock. In particular, I want to know not only on average are they all going in the same direction, but what do the fluctuations look like? Right? If one bird is, is uh, going a little bit off course, um, do the birds around him tend to follow or do they tend to compensate? How does that all work? Okay? And in particular, and, and do the birds actually all kind of talk to each other? Or are there little clumps that are moving independently of each other and only weakly related? I mean, you can imagine all sorts of possibilities, okay? So let me do, um, for the sake of discussion, I wanna, I wanna try and understand the probability distribution, but I'm gonna do a decomposition which is I'm going to take out the speed at which each bird is moving and think about the direction in which it's pointing. Okay. Now, it is not true that all the birds in the flock are flying at exactly the same speed. On average, that has to be true. And clearly, if birds had different speeds that were persistent over time, eventually the flock would tear itself apart, right? So there's something interesting there. Let me separate that problem out and think about the problem where all the birds fly at the same speed. Or rather, I just don't worry about the speed fluctuations. I think only about their directional fluctuations. So just to say something which is going to be obvious to many of you, um, but uh, it needs to be said. <laughs> 
you can't measure the probability distribution. In fact, there's a very important thing, right, which is that when you make the transition from a deterministic description of the world to a probabilistic description of the world, something happens which really you should spend more time thinking about than we usually do when we're teaching, right? <laughs> which is that the fundamental object in your description of the world becomes something that you cannot measure. Which maybe bothers you. I don't know. So you can measure the directions. You can measure the directions that, so you cannot measure whether the probability that a coin will come up heads. All you can do is take the coin and flip it and flip it and flip it and flip it and flip it. And what we mean by probability is the thing to which the fraction of heads is converging. But it doesn't get there in any real experiment, right? So that means that the things you observe, the actual heads or tails, the actual directions of particular birds in a flock, maybe even things that you think you could estimate, like empirical averages, right? Those are not the, those are not the thing that the theory is really about. That's different, for example, from mechanics, as you or, you know the theory of electrical circuits, right? The variables in the theory of electrical circuits are currents and voltages. And you can measure currents and voltages. Now, you maybe know that that's not completely trivial. The probes that you use to measure currents and voltages don't have either infinite or zero resistance. And so you mess up the currents and voltages a little bit, but it's not bad. And, and for mechanics, you know, the equations that we write down are for the positions and velocities of particles. Sorry, for the half of you who are physicists, sorry, the 65% of you who are physicists, yes, I know I should say positions and momenta. I'm just trying to be a little. Um, so, you know, the position of a particle is, to some approximation, what you see when you look at it, right? Now again, that's an approximate statement. You actually see the light that scatters off of it, but classical mechanics is exactly the regime in which that distinction doesn't make any difference. So in some sense, when we start teaching you physics, or we start teaching you population biology or something like that, right? we start by writing down equations for the objects that you measure directly. And then when we tell you, oh, but you, know, you should take a probabilistic point of view, this terrible thing happens, which is that the object of the theory is not something you can measure directly. So that's true, first of all, as a matter of principle, but there's also a matter of practice. I mean, I think for the, the probability of a coin coming up heads, if you had a million coin flips, I suspect that most of the people in the room would be happy to say that they had measured the probability of heads. And I, Insisting that you weren't quite right, that no, 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 it's only an estimator. Yeah, it's an estimator that's accurate to a part in a thousand, so, okay. I mean, that, that seems like really a pedantic distinction. But when you start talking about a system that has many variables, the distinction is not pedantic. If you imagine that that each bird has something like k directions in which it can fly, then p is a list of k to the n numbers, right? If every bird has k choices for which direction it goes in, then two birds have k squared choices, n birds have k to the n choices. <coughs> if n is 2, then 2 to the n, right, for n is 10, 2 to the n is 1,000. For n is 20, it's a million. You can keep going, right? And so an attempt to describe the distribution of what n things are doing always gets you into this exponential explosion of, of possibilities. And so, it must be, if we're going to make any progress in our probabilistic description of the world, that the real distribution is somehow simpler than it could have been. <laughs>
right? Any list of k to the n numbers that adds up something just happened. Um, and in principle, that list doesn't have to have any structure. But then in that case, it's hopeless, right? Because there's no way that you can, I mean, aside from the fact that, OK, you measure things with finite accuracy and everything else, but you would like the number of your measurements to somehow be comparable to the number of things that you care about. And you're not going to measure two to the 1,000 things in a flock of birds. So any attempt at a description of the world in probabilistic terms involves injecting some notion of simplification. Now maybe there's a reason why this simplification arises. Right? Or maybe we're just guessing, and we're going to try it out and see how we do. And I think the attempts to give probabilistic description of biological systems are you know, somewhere in that continuum from we're crossing our fingers to no, 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 we have, we have a good reason for thinking that it should be this simple. Okay? And over the course of these few lectures, you'll see both flavors. So what do I believe? So what is an approach to simplification? So there are many approaches. And let me try one of them for you today. We'll do, a, we'll do a very different one tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow. One idea is, let's keep track of a few important things and let everything else be random. So what does this mean? It means that if I look at this flock of birds, there are some features of the flock of birds that I might really think are important. So for instance, yes? Well, so there's a few things that I'm going to declare are very important. And my probability distribution had better describe those very accurately. And for the rest, I'm going to say, let everything be as random as possible. So for example, in the case of the flock of birds, I believe, and there's, you know, there's a generation of arguments about why this is true, that birds mostly look to their near neighbors to decide what to do. So despite the fact that the whole flock orders, that's not because individual birds see across the entire flock and decide what to do by integrating information over the whole flock. The idea is that this bird here has some neighborhood that it looks in, and it looks to those birds to decide what to do. Now that already could still be complicated, right? Because if I have 10 birds in my neighborhood, there's many complicated functions of 10 vectors that I could compute. But the simplest thing I could think of is to say, let me keep track of the correlation between one bird, here's bird i, and let me sum up the directions in which all the birds in the neighborhood are flying. If you want, you could think about averaging them. That's maybe a slightly more natural thing to do. So let's assume that the neighborhood is of size k. And if it's true that each bird is looking to its neighbors, then certainly each bird should be correlated with the average of what its neighbors are doing. And maybe if I capture that correlation, I've captured the essence of what's going on. So what I'm going to do is to compute this quantity, 
and average it over all the birds. And what I'm going to do is to say that if I compute C on average in my probability distribution, that should be equal to the average C that I see in the experiment. So I want to be sure, since I think the, the interactions of birds with their neighbors are what's important, I want to be sure that whatever model I write down has the property that if I compute the correlation between birds and their neighbors in the model, I get the same answer as I do when I go out and look at the real flock. So for that part, most people would say, OK, fine. If you want to choose that, that's OK. But now I'm going to do the part, and by the way, this doesn't help very much, right? Because I needed to find out k to the n numbers, and this tells me one number. So my simplification is in this part. I'm going to let everything else be as random as possible. And so what does that mean? Well, I want to make the directions the birds are going in be as random as they can be. So of course, one way to do that is you pick every direction at random independently of each other. Well, but if you do that, then you'll get this number wrong. Right? So what I want to do is I want to get this as random as can be while still obeying this constraint. So how do I do that? So as random as possible, if you want to take those words and turn them into equations, it turns out there's only one way to do it. And that's to maximize the entropy of the probability distribution. So you'll remember that entropy has its origins before statistical mechanics in thermodynamics, where it was a kind of bookkeeping device for keeping track of heat flows, right? And there's the second law of thermodynamics that tells you the entropy of the world is always increasing and so on. And then in, in, when statistical mechanics was introduced, there was this object, which was a function of the probability distribution which, it was argued, served as a Lyapunov function for the dynamics of the distribution. And thus, it always changed in one direction. And there was an identification between that and the second law. So I had a function of the probability distribution I could compute. And then if you fast forward to the late 1940s, Shannon is interested in the problem of describing the flow of information and he proves a theorem that if you want to make precise the notion that you gain information by hearing the answer to a question, then the only quantity you can compute that is consistent with certain very simple axioms is the entropy of the distribution of answers. Okay. So what this means is that if I want to ask, you know, how much do I learn so in, if you took a statistical mechanics course, there's some point in the course where they tell you that the entropy is related to your lack of knowledge about the microscopic state of the system. Okay. And that's vague, and the fact that it's your knowledge maybe bothers you, because it's not clear why your knowledge should be a physical property of the system that you're looking at. But um, if you take consistently the view that the states of the system being drawn out of a probability distribution, then what Shannon told us is that if, if the question is, what is the microscopic state of the system, then given that the state comes out of a probability distribution, I know something, but I don't know everything. And if I close that gap and determine exactly what the microscopic state is, then the amount of information I gain will be equal to the entropy. And the reason is that if you want to define information and make it precise, then there are a few axioms you have to obey. If you have more possibilities than all other things being equal, the information should be larger. If the question you're asking has two independent parts, then the information should be the sum of the information you gain from the independent parts, and so on. Okay, the third axiom is a little harder to explain. I don't want to take time right now. But, so what this means is that, that 
If I ask you, how variable are things? How random are they? How much information am I missing about what's going on in detail? The answer is always the same, it's the entropy. If you decide, oh wait a minute, there are other properties of the probability distribution I could compute. I could compute something like the variance. And that of course tells me something about the range of, of, of possibilities and maybe relates to your notion of how random things are. Bigger variance, more random. Except you can get a high variance in two very different ways, right? One is you could have a Gaussian and the variance gets bigger. The other is you could have exactly two alternatives which move further and further apart. And in some sense, when I have exactly two alternatives, my uncertainty or my lack of knowledge is not the same as when I have a, a, a Gaussian, right? In fact, I really just need to know which one it is and then everything else is determined. So actually, this has very little uncertainty associated with it. So what Shannon did was to prove that the only thing that works in all, so it's an example that shows you the variance doesn't always work. So what Shannon proves is only one thing that always works, and that's the entropy. So if I say that what I want to do is to construct a probability distribution which is as random as possible, that the states that I draw out of the distribution are as random as possible, what I should do is look for a probability distribution that has the largest possible entropy. But I want to be sure that this is true. So the entropy is an integral or a sum weighted by the probability distribution of the log of the distribution with a minus sign. Right? So just as a convenient reminder, right? if there are n possibilities, then each, and they're all equally likely, then p is just 1 over n. So when I take the log, I get minus log n. The sign flips, I get log n. Taking the average doesn't do anything because it's just a number. So the entropy is the log of the number of possible states if they're all equally likely. And so that notion of the entropy as the log of the number of possible states should connect to uh, things that you've heard before. Um, it's also what's carved on Boltzmann's gravestone, right? as many of you will know. So what I want to do is to maximize S but I have a constraint which is this equation. So you might think, oh, hard problem, right? I have to search through the space of all possible probability distributions. I have to take only the ones that satisfy the constraint and then find the maximum value of the entropy. And that must be a hard calculation. Well, yes and no. So the form of the answer is very easy to write down. And in fact, many of you know the answer because one way of defining thermodynamic equilibrium is to say that, remember, the second law of thermodynamics tells you the entropy is always increasing. So when you come to equilibrium, it stops and the entropy is as big as it can be. Well, as big as it can be given the constraints on the system. So what's the simplest constraint on the system? It's the average energy. So if you ask for the maximum, a probability distribution that has the maximum possible entropy, given that you know the average energy of the system, the answer is the Boltzmann distribution. So the answer here is the same. So let's do the reminder. Okay. If I have an energy which is a function of a whole bunch of microscopic coordinates, and I ask for a probability distribution over all these variables with maximum entropy and fixed average value of the energy, the answer well, actually, let me do it this way is the Boltzmann distribution. And so e to the minus a constant times the energy, and then some factor out in front that gets the normalization right. And you may remember that this factor of beta 
has a meaning. It's 1 over the absolute temperature. But if you think about, and of course, the fact that this is a temperature and this is really the energy in the sense of mechanics, right? That's very important in statistical physics. But if I just ask you to find a probability distribution <laughs> that has the maximum possible entropy and a fixed value of the energy, average energy, then finding that distribution doesn't make use of the fact that the function that you called energy has a meaning. It's just some function of all the variables. <coughs> that might bother you, but it's true. And in this view, the temperature is just a Lagrange multiplier that you introduced in order to impose the constraint. It's, it turns out to be what the thermometer reads, but that's actually a result, right? It's not obvious that that should be true when you do the calculation. But what this means is that then I know how to do this problem with this constraint, because I just take what was the energy and now call it this function C, which is the correlation of birds with their neighbors. And there's one parameter. I've pulled out the factors of k and n because they don't matter. There's one parameter in this model, and it's j. But remember that there is one constraint, which is that this expectation value of c should be equal to the experimental value. So somewhere there's a plot that you can make, right? If you take this theory and you analyze it, it's clear, right, that if j is bigger than because of the way I've written it with the positive sign here, larger j drives you to be more similar to your neighbors. So there's a plot that looks like this. Presumably, if j goes to infinity, the correlation will be 1. There's an experimental value with an error bar. And so now you know the value of j with an error bar. So by measuring one number from the flock, you have a candidate for a theory of the joint distribution of all of the velocities in the flock. And this is one approach to simplification. OK. So it's been an hour. And of course, this will only be interesting if I tell you about how it relates to experiment, because otherwise, it's just a guess. And there's lots of reasons why this guess could be wrong. On the other hand, it's also true that we've built up a certain amount of structure. And you might have questions about that. So maybe we take a coffee break. We come back. We get questions about what's happened. And I show you how this relates to the data. Sensible? OK. What? The only thing is, well. Right. Sorry, is that OK? okay. Or? Oh, it's a coffee break without coffee. It's a coffee break without coffee. OK. So it's a refresh. It's a somewhat theoretical coffee break, yes. It's a theoretical coffee break. Thank you.
Yes, yes and I'll, uh, and when do you want me to finish? So oh. when, when do you want me to finish? Uh, part of, by uh, 22 one would be uh, Okay, good. So yeah. save best, me five, ten minutes. Case, yeah, because we have a shorter uh, lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we open it for uh, questions about this first part. Let's. So uh, this assumes that C is constant, right, for, for the flock of birds. That's why we want to f fix it, right? Uh, or, or at least that like, we can okay. assume that it's interesting. Uh, uh, what is constant, what is not constant in biology is a matter of opinion, right? Uh, and the problem is, if this is constant, I can solve the problem without doing any calculation. And we all know that scientists are lazy, right? So, so I like the fact that I don't have to do the calculations. So how much of this is justified by the fact that the nature, this correlation is constant versus that we can do the calculation? Okay, so um, <clears throat> so actually this question is really, uh, you, were, you were nice and you didn't stop me when I wrote this. So what does the average in the experiment mean? So let me point out that there's a couple of things going on here. In, um, I said you should keep track of the correlation of birds with their neighbors. So the first thing you might have thought of was, well, every bird is different, right? So I can keep track of, uh, of Bob's correlation with his neighbors and Alice's correlation with her neighbors. And to measure the average, I should average over time. The problem is that in a flock of birds, your neighbors change with time. So in order to define an average over time, I would have to decide what I'm going to do about all that. The alternative is that the flock is big. And so I can define an average over the flock, over space. But then I'm ex implicitly assuming that all the birds are the same. That might just be wrong, because there could be sergeant birds who tell everybody where to go. But even if there isn't that, there's the fact that there are the birds on the boundary of the flock, which, for example, have different numbers of neighbors, and so maybe I should only compute the average in the interior of the flock. And maybe when it comes time to compare with experiment, I should hold what happens at the, flock, at the boundary fixed and only compute what happens inside. It's still true, right, that if I compute the average over the flock, if the flock were infinitely large, then this is a deterministic object. But since it's finitely large, it is something that I expect will have fluctuations. But for example, if I do it in successive snapshots across an entire movie of watching the flock, I find that it hardly fluctuates at all. So in that sense, this seems like a sensible thing to say, aha, I computed an estimate of the expectation value with error bars, because it does fluctuate a little bit. Um, you still have to do a calculation which is, for example, this. Right, you do, you do have to calculate, uh, I mean, so uh, maybe this was something I should have said at the beginning. Um, in statistical mechanics, the fact that we can write down the probability distribution, uh, what's the, in Feynman's lectures on statistical mechanics, he said, you know, the Boltzmann distribution sits at the top of a mountain. So you can either try to climb up or you can do the long, uh, the long slide down. So the fact that I can write down a probability distribution for n variables does not solve anything, right? Computing anything from that distribution is in general difficult to do. So um, to actually tell you what the flock is going to do, I still have to do quite a bit of work. Hi. So you talked about the relation between Shannon's entropy, spatial theoretical mm. entropy, and Boltzmann, physical entropy. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I don't understand the relation because, for example, their units are different. Entropy is like something relating to energy and whatever, and information theoretic one is in bits. So how can you reconcile that? Ah, so 
what Shannon proved was that if you want to measure information, then you should compute the entropy of the distribution. But obviously, none of the, none of the axioms tell you um, a determine the function to within a multiplicative constant. So strictly speaking, what Shannon proved was that the only measure of information is minus constant times the sum of p log p. Now the question is, how do you choose the constant? Also, how do you choose the base of the logarithm, which are related? Because if you change the base of the logarithm, you change the constant. So as always, the question of units are arbitrary. So, the fa so let's talk about entropy and thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Um, already, physicists can't quite agree. One version is you should define the entropy where the constant, maybe I should be less, uh, so. Um, so if I define S is minus a constant times a sum So these are all my states. Or if I'm an information theorist, they might be the answers to questions, or they might be messages that I'm trying to transmit, right? All the usual things. So there are many choices here, right? Um, so one idea is k equals Boltzmann's constant. and the log is the natural log. So this is um, a choice which you will find in many physics textbooks. <clears throat> Another choice you'll find in physics textbooks is the constant equals one, and the log is the natural log. And that means that instead of taking the temperature, you should always take Boltzmann's constant times the temperature which explicitly acknowledges the fact that temperature is really energy, and so you should measure it. We already have a unit for energy, so we don't need another one for temperature, right? After all, Kelvin is a conventional unit also, right? I mean, nobody, I mean, we know where it comes from, but it's arbitrary. And you know this because there are other parts of the world in which they use different units, right? Uh, where I live, for example, I don't know why, but Right, we use Fahrenheit. <laughs> Nobody knows why we use this unit. Um, so uh, these are choices. Now it gets worse um, because if you're a chemist, you might decide that you should use something called the gas constant instead of Boltzmann's constant. And this is actually Avogadro's number times Boltzmann's constant. But because it's the gas constant, you will often see it written, particularly in elementary chemistry books, as being in liter atmospheres per Kelvin. That's so that it goes into the ideal gas law, and you measure pressure in atmospheres and volume in liters, and everything works out. I will remind you that if you take a pressure and, and multiply by a volume, you get an energy. And so liter atmospheres is just some really weird unit of energy. You understand where, why they do it, but it's very weird, okay? So, and, and then of course, in information theory, um, k equals one, and the log is log to the base two, because the, if you think about answering questions, the most elementary question is one that only has two possible answers. And so that's the natural choice of units. And then the quantity you get are called bits. So you can make any choice you want. It doesn't matter. So that's, the, that's the, the easy part of your question. The harder part, which is why should it be that the information theoretic object and the thermodynamic object are the same? That's much deeper. Right? Um, 
remember in information theory, it's not only that it's this abstract measure of how, many, how much information you gain on answering a question, it's also the shortest amount of space you need in order to write down the answer. Right? So there's a coding theorem. So what this means, for example, is that if you measure the uh, positions and velocities of all the gas molecules in this room, type them into a computer file, and do uh, gzip, right, to compress the file, and then you warm the room up by 10 degrees centigrade and you do it again, you will discover that the file is longer. And because of this equivalence between the thermodynamic entropy, the statistical mechanics entropy, and the shortest code length, according to Shannon, the amount by which the file is longer will be up to units the amount of heat that you needed to put into the gas in order to warm it up by 10 degrees. So I actually find that quite mysterious. It's true. There's no, there's no problem. Um, so it's a clearly very deep fact about all of this. But, okay. <laughs> so we have time for one more. Um, so in the Boltzmann distribution, the, um, the exponential of uh, energy, and we have the exponential of beta, which gives uh, a, the inverse temperature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in this probability distribution, there is a very similar term, and I would like to know what does J define as uh, an analog to the inverse temperature? Okay. So, if we try to maximize entropy and fix the expectation value of some function of my variables, then what we get is that the probability distribution looks like e to, let me call it lambda, f of si. So this is what I called j before. Okay? And it's lambda because it's a Lagrange multiplier in the, okay? So this looks a lot like the Boltzmann distribution. And that's very useful because it doesn't just look like it. It is mathematically equivalent to some equilibrium statistical mechanics problem. And that might be an equilibrium statistical mechanics problem that I understand. And so I can use my understanding of that statistical mechanics problem to help me predict what the flock is going to do. And in this case, this is true. So for the physicists in the audience, what this is is the three-dimensional Heisenberg model on a funny lattice. Now, you might be worried that because I've recovered something that looks like the Boltzmann distribution, I'm describing a system which is in thermal equilibrium. And that's not true. For example, if I, tell you, if I ask you to find the maximum entropy probability distribution consistent with the variance of the variable x, the answer is a Gaussian. And if I tell you that, you say, yeah, it's because Gaussians are very random, blah, blah, blah. Nobody worries about energy and thermodynamics. It's just that when I do this to flocks, you worry because they're you know, clearly not in equilibrium. Let me also point out that I did this calculation. This, I chose this as the introductory example precisely because it's going to turn out that keeping track of only this one thing is enough in order to reproduce the data which I still have to tell you. I'm watching the clock. And it's because there's only one thing that you get something that looks so much like the Boltzmann distribution. Suppose I had to keep track of two things. So for instance, it was important to keep track not only of let's say your correlations with your, your, your linear correlations with your neighbors, but some higher order thing. I don't know. Pick your favorite thing. Then in that case, I'd get another term in the exponential. And so now it's looking a little bit less like the Boltzmann distribution, right? Because I have two things. Of course, you could also view it as being an energy function which is more complicated because it's built out of two kinds of interactions. You can always take that point of view, but unless this was actually the energy in the sense of mechanics, you are not describing a system as in thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay. 
But you might also worry about the dynamics. So a very different way of trying to get at a probabilistic description of some biological system is to say, well, let me write down a dynamics for the individual variables and let that dynamics be a little bit noisy. So for example, suppose I said that the velocity of each bird relaxes on some time scale to the average of the velocities in the neighborhood, but the dynamics are noisy. Now, this model doesn't actually have all the velocities have this, doesn't, they don't, birds don't all have the same speed. So you need to be a little bit more careful. But this model is actually um, the model that Vicek and Toner and Tu wrote down in the mid-1990s for flocks and swarms, roughly. In some suitable approximation, these dynamics will generate that probability distribution. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the role of J? J is somehow telling you how tightly correlated you are with your neighbors, which is how fast you relax versus how strongly the noise drives you away. And if you're only interested in the stationary probability distribution, then it's only the ratio that matters. So you could try to get at that distribution through these dynamics. It's important to know, actually, for the case of birds, it's not such a big deal. But when we talk about neurons, it'll be much more important that there are infinitely many dynamics that can generate the same stationary distribution. And some of those dynamics correspond to uh, dynamics with detailed balance. And so the system is, in some sense, an equilibrium system. And other, dy other dynamics don't have that property. But they could still generate the same stationary distribution. Nope. Okay. So I think that for a matter of time, okay. um, we can give some joy to the biologists in the room. Okay. So, um, so what? So remember the strategy, right? We know from many physics examples that often we can get away with writing down models which are much simpler than the microscopic reality, and we still get macroscopic behaviors right. And that's not just luck, right? We actually understand why it works in some cases. Now we transport ourselves into this context which is vastly more complicated, and at this point we're crossing our fingers that something similar will be true, that simpler models will work. And there's different strategies for simplifying. And I've shown you one strategy, which is to say, hold on to the things that you think are most relevant about the system. Be sure that your model gets those right, and then strip away any other structure by making things as random as possible. I, I sometimes like to say that this is the opposite of what we usually do as theorists. Usually as theorists, we're trying to bend nature to our will. We, we know how things are supposed to be, and we're trying to make the world look that way. Here it's the opposite. It says there's something that my experimentalist friends measured that I really believe in. And so I'm going to take that very seriously so that my model reproduces that exactly. And then everything else I'm going to throw away. I take away all my prejudices about all the other structure. So how do I tell if I'm right? Well, you have to calculate something you have to calculate something that the experimentalists can measure and that they have confidence in that is not the thing you used in building the model. Obviously, one of the things you can compute is this. And they have confidence in it, otherwise you wouldn't have taken it seriously. But we've already used this, so we have to use something else. So let's ask, suppose that I compute um, the correlation with birds that are some distance r away. And I should be a little careful in defining what I mean by correlation for the reasons related to your question about, to Stefano's question about what am I averaging over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from each bird, I'm going to subtract the average 
over all the birds. And I'm gonna, so I'm already, I'm going into the, into the frame that's moving with the flock, right? And it's pointing in the average direction. I'm gonna ask, how do the fluctuations of the individual birds around that average, how are they related to one another in the flock? So let me define Let me define, so I have bird i and bird j, and in each case I subtract off the mean of this unit vector. And then what I want to do is I want to pick out all the pairs i and j, which are a certain distance apart. So let me average over all the pairs that have ij, rij equal to r. And I've got thousands of birds in the flock, right? So this defines a correlation function of R. So it starts at some point. And actually, an amazing feature of these data is that they're quite featureless. You might think there'd be some characteristic length over which birds are correlated in. No. It basically looks like this. And let me remind you that the neighbors have a distance which is, you know, the, the, you know they, almost, they don't quite touch each other, right? So, you know, these are starlings. They're about this big. But the flock is tens of meters across. So the picture looks like this, right? These are the neighbors whose average correlation, this average value up here, is basically C. It's the thing you used. But then you get C of R. And then you can ask, what do I get if I calculate this in this model? So how do you do that calculation? Well, um, you might think that what you need to do is Monte Carlo, right? You have a probability distribution. You have to draw samples out of it. And that might be a good idea. But in fact, the flock is very strongly polarized. Everybody's very strongly correlated with everybody else. That means that J is large. That means that the fluctuations are actually quite small. And so there's an approximation you can use which is valid at large J. And you can make a lot of analytic progress and reduce the problem to inverting a few, matri a a few large matrices as opposed to doing a whole Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. By the way, let me emphasize. The reason this is all possible is that a little over 10 years ago, uh, my colleagues in Rome, Andrea Cavagna, Rena Giardina, and their friends, um, succeeded in uh, building instruments that would allow them to capture um, the positions and velocities of flocks of birds, flocks of starlings, um, in, the, in the evenings over the square in front of the train station in Rome. Um, it's a marvelous story. Uh, in order to do this, you have to climb up onto a historic building, which you get permission from a different ministry in order to do. You're not allowed to leave the instruments up there, so every day you have to bring them up and calibrate them. Um, you're trying to do, uh, you, you can't do the thing you'd like to do, which for example, you can do with a swarm, with a swarm of insects, right? You can put one camera here and one camera here around the swarm. But if the flock is out there, that's very hard to do. So that means that all you can do is put an array of cameras and hope to do stereo, right? Uh, and you have the problem that when you look at the flock, sometimes the birds seem to occlude each other. So there's all sorts of difficulties of doing the three-dimensional reconstruction, which leads you into very interesting computer vision problems. OK, there's a lot here. So convincing yourself that you can actually do this is a big job. And there's a beautiful series of papers. I will give you a set of notes. So those of you who are more interested in how the experiments work, you can read those. Those of you who are interested in the theory, you can read those. Um, I'll be sure you get those tonight. But anyhow, the end result is that they can reconstruct the velocities and positions of, of, of each individual bird in flocks of a few thousand um, as they pass through their field of view. Okay, the next generation of experiments will track them, right? But first generation was just as they pass by. So the data look like this. And if you now calculate from the theory what you get, 
you get that. And out here, I mean, there should really be error bars on the, on the data as well. And the error bars out here are hard to estimate because there aren't very many pairs of birds that are that far apart. So you kind of have to decide what you mean by an error bar. Okay. The agreement is essentially perfect. And there's no fitting. Because I'll remind you that there was only one number, j, that you needed to know. And that's determined by the value of c. So basically, you've pinned the curve here. And everything else over an order of magnitude or more in distance is predicted by the theory. You can predict other things. My favorite one is the one where you take four birds, which are distance, the two pairs are distance little r apart individually, and they're capital R apart. And you measure the correlation among the four in excess of what you expected from the pairs. And this now can be a function of the, of the distance as well. And this also fits perfectly. No free parameters. Importantly, this is an object that has four birds in it, whereas the thing that you fixed in order to build the theory, you can think of as being built only out of pairs of birds. So the fact that we kept track of pairs was enough to predict higher order structure. You can keep going. There's more. Okay. So what the reason that I like to give this as um, an introductory example, first of all, flocks of birds are beautiful. They're fun to work on. Um, provides an excuse to visit Rome. Anyhow. Um, but it is a very concrete example of what I think of as explicit simplification. In order to make progress on this whole class of problems, you have to simplify. So tell me what your simplifying hypothesis is. And in this strategy, it's very easy to say that. It is, I take this quantity very seriously as characteristic of the behavior of the system, and I let everything else be as random as it can be. And it turns out that's enough. And it allows you to predict, in some sense, the propagation of order throughout the entire flock by only keeping track of your local correlations. So there is no effect that we can see that requires you to keep track of higher order correlations. They come out, you can predict what the higher order correlations are, knowing only the lower order correlation. Okay. So, um, so that's what I like about the example. We're going to need to do better than this. In fact, you need to do better than this if you want to describe the fluctuations in speed. But we're going to, tomorrow we'll, um, we'll pick a different example. Um, I'll give you the reference where we think about the fluctuations in speed. Um, and maybe I stop here. Thank you. So we we'll stop here for lunch. Um, we we'll resume at quarter past two. So we have one and a half hour for lunch. Yeah. So the program, the program in the web page is updated. Outside is not. So uh, quarter past two.